This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I'm speaking with Daniel Boyarin. We'll be talking about Judaism, uh, its history, its roots, and what it is. The conversation will begin in a moment. Daniel Boyarin is my guest. He is an expert on Judaism. As I usually like to do, I want to talk about a little bit about his background. So, Daniel, if you could give me a little uh, a preci of uh, who you are, where you come from, and your views uh, on Judaism. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I'm a, a prof professor of Talmudic culture at the University of California at Berkeley, where I've been for 29 years. Uh, following an early stage in my career when I was a professor at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba, and then for uh, a number of years, professor or associate professor at uh, Bar Ilan University in in Ramat Gan in Israel. Um, at Bar Ilan, I was professor in Talmud. Well, um, just before we started, you had uh, mentioned to me that. Uh, you, I guess, would say you don't have the most orthodox views on Judaism uh, as uh, many other scholars may have. So let me just ask, uh, before we get to the roots of Judaism, whether they are mythic or, or factual or historic, uh, let me just ask you what your, what your place in the scholarship pantheon of Judaism is. Are you considered a heretic? Are you considered uh, uh, a reformer of, uh, of uh, what was considered history, but you believe is myth. What is your place within uh, such I'm studies? Sort of, uh, I guess I'm considered an aging enfant to read. <laughs> okay. Well, um, let me let me start with Judaism, because uh, I've done a couple of shows first on Mormonism, then Buddhism, and uh, uh, Judaism's place in history, uh, at least in human religion, is often thought of to be the first monotheistic religion. Um, would you agree with that? And do you think that monotheism really was or is an improvement over polytheistic beliefs? Well, first of all, as I, as I hinted to you, I was going to make Soros for you, <laughs> because as far as I'm concerned, the whole concept of religion and religions is a modern concept. Uh -huh. So uh, there was no Buddhism, there was no Hinduism, there was no Judaism until sometime around the 18th century. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've just completed a book, I should tell you, called The History of Judaism, mm -hmm. a Philological Investigation, in which I will be making these arguments at length. So, of course, I'm just going to uh, sketch them in today. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially, essentially, the argument is that there was such a tight connection between the what we might call the, the ritual lives of peoples and every other aspect of their life, um, what we call politics, what we call culture, uh, what we call governance, etc., that until the early modern period, there really is nothing to separate out and call uh, their religion. Jews certainly had no word that means the Jewish religion until uh, the uh, early 19th century. And, and no Jewish languages have a word that means Jewish religion mm -hmm. until the 19th century. So w would you argue then that Judaism was really Jewry uh, in an ethnic sense, that Jews were an ethnic group, but they did become a formal religion until a couple of centuries ago? Something like that, yes. I, I would argue that, that Jewry is a collective uh, of the sort that we might call ethnic. Uh, that's also, by the way, an anachronistic modern term. But at least the word ethnos exists in, in, in ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Jewry were fit under the category of ethnos. We had our God, we had our practices, we had our history, our language, our land. Um, uh, a people who worshipped, of course, and uh, performed rituals and had certain taboos and things that were forbidden or permitted or enjoined, uh, but they they weren't a separate sphere of life as we uh, consider them. Mm 
today. Well, I was going to uh, follow up here uh, and ask you that uh, uh, I see that you had done a study on uh, an old uh, rabbi from uh, Spain uh, several centuries ago. Uh, would you get into an argument with him, I guess? Because he would probably say, you're crazy. What are you saying? That there's no Judaism. I'm a rabbi. Uh, I, I think I know a little bit more about it than you. Um, what? Uh, so it, it seems to me you have a definition uh, that there's a difference yes, between culture and religion. Difference. What? I think it's the exact opposite. So if a modern scholar came to him and said to him, what can you tell me about Judaism? He would say, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. That's exactly the point. Yeah. How could he if there's no word that meant Judaism, in, not in Hebrew or not in uh, Judeo-Spanish or in any other Jewish language that he would happen to be speaking? There's no word that means Judaism in, in Yiddish. Well, would they call themselves Israelis or Israelites then? Israel, yes. Yeah. That's what we call ourselves. We call ourselves Israel, Bnei Israel, Bnei Israel for the uh, women of Israel. Uh -huh. And just the word Israel means an individual uh, member of the Israelite people that we've come to call the Jewish people. Well, then, if you want to use that term, though, was uh, was what we would consider. A, Jewish, ethnic Jew Jews, were they the first people to come up with, as far as you know, the idea of a monotheistic God? Uh, w, y, what is it? Y, H, uh, W, H? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Yeah. First of all, of course, we know that about the time of Moses, if Moses really existed at uh -huh. that time, there was a very important monotheistic movement in Egypt. Uh -huh. And many scholars have argued that that Moses' uh, realization of monotheism was part and parcel of that historical process that took place in Egypt. It didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't last all that long in Egypt. Once that pharaoh died, um, they went back to the old, old gods and old ways. But so, I, I don't know about first. And then secondly, uh, many scholars, this is not my shtick, have queried the, the very understanding of the term monotheism um, and whether whether monotheism really is an appropriate term for for uh, an ancient ancient usage uh, mm -hmm. referring to um, the work of Paul Fredrickson for instance uh, teaches at the Hebrew University now retired from uh, Boston University who explicitly wrote an article arguing that that the term monotheism is inappropriate for 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 antiquity. Mm -hmm. So um, so these, these these stories that you're reflecting and you're reflecting them accurately, of course, represent, I think, to a great extent, modern constructions, uh, modern apologetic constructions, to. Um, Produce in good faith. I'm not saying people are liars, of course, God forbid, but to produce um, a sense of unity, of um, um, historical continuity uh, that goes back from, uh, I like to say, you know, from 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 Moshe Rabbeinu to Moses Mendelssohn. Mm -hmm. right? Well, from what I'm getting from you, you take a, a skeptical, more scientific approach to things. So let me ask you then, uh, and let's sort of just go back and try to chronologically chart uh, the Is Israeli uh, or Israelite uh, uh, ethnic group then. Uh, I would assume that most scholars, from what I've heard of, uh, would say that what we call the Jews were they a, tr a, a band of people, a tribe of people that were wandering North Africa, uh, you know, three, four, five thousand years ago? It, would that be where the origins are? No, not North Africa. No, where then? Uh, in, in the in the Fertile Crescent in in Palestine. If if so, somewhere in the Fertile Crescent, probably north and east of uh, of, pa of what we call Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And would would uh, they would they have originated uh, as a as a distinct, at least ethnic, or you know, uh, integrated no, group. No, it's much more complicated than that. And this is not my uh -huh. again, not my idiosyncratic work. Um, 
most scholars today see what we call Israel as a combination of different of different groups. The, uh, some apparently coming from Egypt, where they may or may not have been slaves. Others that were uh, coming in from other parts of uh, the Fertile Crescent. Mm -hmm. Some that may have been native to to the, the Palestinian hill country, mm -hmm. and that uh, joined together and formed um, over time uh, this historical group. So you just mentioned uh, the so-called so slavery in Egypt. Are you one of the people that is skeptical of that? Because I I know I, I was raised as a Lutheran and we were taught about, you know, Moses. And we all saw the Ten Commandments, the DeMille film and whatnot. Uh, are, are you one of those people that would say that that did not occur? No. No, I would not say it did not occur. But I would say that the story of Basically, let me just ask you then, uh, are you, how do you view a lot of these religious texts, whether you consider it the, the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, the depictions, do you see that as having any historical value, or are these mostly just a set of myths, no different than the Norse myths? Well, first of all, they're different in, in kind from the Norse myths or the Greek myths. Um, in so far as they 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 really uh, uh, do describe a great deal of uh, you know actual what we might call human history on the ground, mm -hmm. right? Um, so even uh, even if the uh, uh, the framework or uh, many of the details seem to be less than likely as history, there's certainly a lot that we can learn mm -hmm. um, historically from them. Now, I'm not a scholar, actually, of, of neither of Scandinavian myths nor Greek myths, mm -hmm. and it could be that my colleagues in those fields will, will say, well, it's exactly the same. We learn mm -hmm. a lot about early Norse history from, you know, from the sagas and uh, uh, etc. cetera. I, I know that Homer is taken very seriously as a source for history. Not necessarily because those stories took place, but because a, a lot of the details of daily life that are described or of, uh, um, you know, modes of governance and modes of livings uh, uh, seem to be corroborated by other sources and, uh, and to make a great deal of sense. So, uh, yeah. So, but, uh, you know, when when we think of uh, the Jewish people and we think of the biblical uh, stories, uh, you mentioned how you were skeptical, perhaps, of Moses' existence. Certainly, Jesus Christ is the biggest question mark, not only whether he was a historical figure or whether he was based on uh, myths from surrounding cultures like Egypt, uh, but, of course, if he, even if he did exist, was he somehow divine or whatnot? Then, of course, stories like, you know, David and Goliath and, and whatnot. Uh, so do you do you look uh, at each of these kinds of stories and take varying degrees of skepticism regarding them? Um, I have very little doubt that what that Jesus was a historical figure. I certainly don't. Um, I'm not attracted to and don't accept the, the uh, scholarly versions, which by the way are quite outdated by now, that uh, see this all as a, uh, you know, a, a put together story from uh, um, either Egypt uh, of Cyrus myths or whatever uh, they, used to, they used to do. Now as to whether Jesus was divine or not, that's a theological question. It's not a historical question. Yeah. It's not a question that can be answered by historical means. It's not a question that can be falsified by historical means. Mm -hmm. It's a question of belief. Mm -hmm. Well, let me then ask about uh, uh, the Israelite, uh, uh, I guess, ethnic group then throughout history. Uh, 
what was the reason for a, a lot of the persecution then? Was it their belief system? Was it uh, their cultural success within multiple societies? Because, you know, you get the, the, you know, if you look today, quote unquote, Asian Americans often score higher than whites and blacks and Hispanics on uh, various uh, tests and whatnot. And, and Jews seem to have been able to go from the Middle East to the Far East to Russia to Europe to the New World and have always had success. What do you think accounts for, though, uh, the lingering anti-Semitism that goes around? Was it initially based upon the beliefs expressed within the what you, I guess, we'll just call the Jewish religion, or is it an ethnic bias? It's a good question. Um, it's a good question. I, I, it's a, you know, it's a question that people have been trying to answer for thousands of years. Um, my intuition is that it's it was that very refusal to disappear to assimilate to just to become like everybody else and i think that that's a lot of it now too when uh, even among even among jewish friends um even among jewish friends and acquaintances i see them sometimes cringing if we walk past uh, a Hasidic guy or you know somebody who looks quote unquote too Jewish why can't they look like everybody else yeah. why can't they be like everybody else yeah. and uh, to, to my mind uh, a lot of the of the significance of being Jewish is precisely not being like everybody else so and that that does make people uh, more or less uncomfortable let me let me then uh, just talk a little bit about some of what we'd call, I guess, the ethnic divisions, and, and put aside uh, uh, any the differences between reform or orthodox or whatnot. We can talk about that in a moment. But probably the two main groups that people speak of are the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews, and then there are a few other smaller little groups here or there. So this would tend to to, to make uh, it seem that. Uh, Judaism is certainly not, there's, there's no Jewish race per se, there's no uh, even a Jewish ethnic group, uh, that, that Judaism is more or less, even if only in the last couple of hundred years, is a, a religion. Where did the, 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 the two main groups, Ashkenazi and Sephardic, arise from, and how did they come to the same belief systems? <laughs> First of all, I think you've got it upside down. I mean, I think they diverged. Okay. Um, that, uh, well, they're still close enough that we can call them Jews. I mean, you know, just like we can call a no, Lutheran no, and a Calvinist. Right, it's not that they came to have the same, okay. whatever you call it, belief system. They started and diverged. Much, much more varied and complex, I think, than, than you're presenting it okay. or imagining it. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, I, I certainly think that... Uh, that Jews all over the world share a common history. But if they are, if they, but my point is, if they are considered to be uh, separate ethnically, and I believe, for example, I forget if it's Ashkenazis or Sephardics, for example, are, are more prone to getting sickle cell anemia than one of the, I forget which group it is. I mean, this would suggest that they were initially different groups of people ethnically that came together maybe and lived in a certain area of the world for a certain time and interbred and cross-culturalized, etc. Yeah, that's certainly, that's what I said. Yeah. But I think that took place in biblical times. Okay. So, I don't, I don't see why one would think that Sephardi Jews and Ashkenazi Jews are separate ethnic groups. No. Um, we're, uh, we're a, a di diasporic nation. A diasporic nation. The, uh, the term diaspora means that we have double cultural uh, uh, context, double cultural references. Mm -hmm. That a Jew who lives in America, to, to the extent that she is uh, an active uh, participant in jury um, has a double cultural reference. She's um, an American with with the language, with the with the with the culture, with the, um, even some of the values, a great many of the values for good and for ill of America. But she also has a second language, mm 
Hebrew, yeah. which is shared with, 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 with Jews from all over the world. And, and a whole set of cultural references that are uh, shared with Jews all over the world. So that's exactly what dias- diaspora means, having that double, that double cultural reference. Well, let me then, uh, since you uh, demarcated, uh, I guess, Jewishness or, or Judaism has only been a couple of centuries old, what to you it was the event or the person or the book or the idea that first... I guess crystallized what we'd call modern Judaism. Um, Moses Mendelssohn's work, I guess. And he was. Moses Mendelssohn was an 18th century German um, Orthodox Jew who was a philosopher, mm-hmm. was deeply, deeply involved with German culture. He, um, he translated the Bible into German but then printed it in Hebrew letters, not Yiddish, Mm. but German written in Hebrew letters. Mm. And part of his project, an important part of his project, was to move Jews from speaking Yiddish, which they had done in Germany up to that point, or in the whole area, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, uh, um, Alsace-Lorraine, Jews spoke Yiddish. And uh, one, one part of his project was to get Jews acculturated to uh, what they call standard German. Mm-hmm. Um, I call it Christian German. And Yiddish is Jewish German. Because there is so much of the um, cultural, theological, philosophical, ideological baggage carried by the particular language that when you switch from one type of language, namely from Jewish language, like Yiddish, and start speaking uh, a language like German, which is so deeply infused with Christian theological ideas. After all, Martin Luther was one of the main um, architects of of the German language, as it were. That that involves deep cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. And it's at about that time, and I'm not going to say this was the only cause, but I think it was one cause, that Jews start saying things like, well, we're Germans, just like every other German, just we have a different religion. Mm -hmm. And that's when religion and the idea of Judaism as a religion became prominent. Mm -hmm. And so what was, uh, was there a landmark work that he published uh, that, you know, sort of codified this the way, say, the Communist Manifesto or Capital uh, marked the beginning of communism. What what what's his seminal work? Uh, it's called uh, it's uh, you know I'm blanking right now, but I think it's called Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah. And was it was this uh, was this a history of Judaism prior to then? Was this a no? A, no it's a kind of a uh, no. It's a it, it's a polemical essay about about Judaism. Okay. It's quite brilliant. I mean he was extraordinary. He was a friend of he was a friend of Lessing, you know, he was considered uh, the the play Natan Natan Der Weise, Nathan the Wise, you know, uh, and he is with the main character was modeled on Mendelssohn. Yeah. Well, now you mentioned the diaspora and you mentioned Mendelssohn. Was this also the beginnings of what would be considered Zionism, that the, the idea for a Jewish or an Israeli state, a modern state as well? No, I don't think so. No. I mean, in the sense that there, there were always Jews who dreamed of it. And we certainly still are dreaming for the Messiah to come uh-huh. and make it happen. Uh, but uh, but the, the idea of Zionism is is the end of the 19th century, mm-hmm. really, a uh, hundred years later than uh, Moses Mendelssohn. But does Zionism, is Zionism simply a political uh, Jewish idea, or is it also infused within religious context? It's a pol- political idea that has, that has taken on religious trappings mm-hmm. fairly recently. In the beginnings of Zionism, most Orthodox Jews and, and virtually all Orthodox Jews, not all, were 
deeply opposed to it and considered it a, uh, considered it a heresy. Um, so, I mean, back before before World War II, certainly there were a lot of uh, Jews in Europe, and you mentioned Yiddish, and uh, Yiddish is uh, often considered. People think it, it's uh, Jewish, but it's it's really a, a lot of German slang and a lot of Eastern European language, and, and sort of a stew of of languages thrown together. Um, was what was the import of Yiddish? as a language in defining uh, Jewry or Judaism? It's, um, it's a very good question. First, let me, let me sit, uh, correct a little bit. Not a stew of languages, any more than any other languages, right? Uh, Yiddish is a German dialect. Um, like most uh, dialects of minority groups or peripheral groups, it's somewhat more conservative than the than the, the main language of German, just like the the English the English of Appalachia is more conservative than the English of London. Right? And that's that's a, a well known um, phenomenon. Secondly, a, a major component of it major component of it is a an extensive Jewish vocabulary that uh, was taken over from earlier Jewish languages, from Jewish, uh, uh, Judeo-French, Judeo-Provençal, uh, various dialects of Judeo-Latin, um, which then were uh, uh, transferred into the forming of Yiddish. Third, Western Yiddish, that is the Yiddish of Germany, Holland, Switzerland, France, did not have Slavic in it. That, that is a product of the uh, growth of Eastern Yiddish in Slavic in Slavic countries. Mm -hmm. right? So that's not a that's not a uh, an essential characteristic of Yiddish. It is deeply deeply characteristic of the majority of Yiddish speakers after Western Yiddish died out. Western Yiddish died out because uh, Jews were so strongly encouraged to take up German and they took up German and abandoned Yiddish. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, yeah, I know. My parents were, were German and they spoke Yiddish, and I, I sometimes argued with people. I said. Uh, People think Yiddish is just Jew spoken. I said, no, uh, working class Germans spoke Yiddish too. I mean, I grew up in New York and uh, Germans and, 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 and Jews could speak Yiddish to each other. My parents, if they were talking about something I didn't want to, they didn't want me to know about, they'd speak in Yiddish. So, um, Yeah, I know. And Irish cops used to speak Yiddish. Yeah. You know, uh, there, were, there were always non Jews who spoke Yiddish. Mm -hmm. um, let me just uh, then talk about uh, what. Post Mendelssohn, what have been the defining characteristics of modern Judaism? Then, uh, three or four or five major characteristics, theologically at least. Um, I suppose a um, a uh, a, um, a strong attraction to neo Kantianism, um, incorporating again very Kantian ideas about what monotheism is. What's interesting is that you find these in in reform, in uh, orthodox, and in conservative circles. Very similar um, theological ideas in the strict sense of theology as the doc doctrines about God. Um, a strong commitment to what is called ethical monotheism is shared, right? The term ethics is significant for all uh, modern uh, Jewish denominations. Um, of course, it's very differently inflected from between groups that uh, believe that we should keep the Torah and groups that have abandoned the Torah. Uh, but I, I suppose they speak as similar languages of ethics, um, commitment to a shared Jewish history yeah. is characteristic. Uh, 
Well, let me ask you uh, uh, just for a definition, because uh, I know a lot of people uh, probably get lost that when they talk about the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Uh, is the Torah, is, that is, uh, how many books of the, the the Old Testament? Is that like the first seven or eight books? Or? It's complicated. Uh, but essentially, the Torah is the first five books. So it's, the, it's what also known as the Pentateuch. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, we call it Hebrew Chumash, which means the five. Yeah. Okay. And that would be, is that generally rendered, is the King James Version, for example, of the Bible considered that, or is the Torah specifically written in Hebrew? Uh, I didn't catch. F uh, would the Torah would would a, a rabbi consider the King James version of the first five books of the Bible the Torah, or does it have to be written in Hebrew? No, it doesn't have to be written in Hebrew. But the King James version is not the version accepted, and it does have to be written in Hebrew in order to be read in the synagogues, yeah. you know, for liturgical purposes. Uh, but we we have translations into many languages. The oldest translation of the of the Torah is, was into Greek in the third century BC. Mm -hmm. It's called the Septuagint, yeah. and we have uh, we have modern Jewish translations that are uh, 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 not too many people read the King James anymore, including Protestants. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been so much modified. Yeah, we uh, we've talked a little bit about. Uh, ethnic Jewry and, and some divisions. Let me just ask, because you, you mentioned three uh, strains of modern Judaic thought, uh, conservative, uh, orthodox, and reformed. Are these modern uh, Are these modern concepts, and what do they represent uh, in relation to each other? They're certainly modern concepts. Uh, before, before all this, the, before there was reform, there was no orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. It was just Judith, Yiddishkeit, you know, just the, the way Jews live, mm -hmm. with me, with many disagreements. Uh, as I mean, we all know the, old, the jokes about two Jews, three three opinions, etc. Um, but uh, uh, not or, organized into denominations. The closest thing to a denominational difference that you might talk about in the pre-modern period is the, the division between Hasidim and non-Hasidim mm -hmm. in Europe. But even that was not really uh, denominations, although there could be a great deal of hostility between the Hasidim and non-Hasidim uh, in, in, in various places. But there was also hostility between different Hasidic groups. So. Yeah. And then they're not, they're not really denominations in that in that modern sense. So, the uh, denominations start when when uh, when people really break off from the tradition and 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 seek to radically change it. Well, when where would the Hasidic Jews uh, are they considered uh, conservative or, or orthodox? Yeah. Orthodox. Orthodox. Absolutely. And what's the difference? Because uh, Reformed Jews generally, uh, from my growing up, are considered more, I guess we would call social liberals. Uh, conserv what's the difference then between an Orthodox and a conservative then? Is that just a political difference? You know, because uh, I generally have heard well, conservative Jews uh, in relation to Israel, the state. No, Reform, reform, classic reform. Now, this is changing on the ground. It's changing all the time. But classic reform rejected the so-called ceremonial part of the Torah. They simply rejected it. That's what the reform meant. And that, that, that means things like a bris and the various uh, the various religious... Uh, bris, they, they ate... They ate uh, fish. Uh, they ate pork. Pork, pork. Bacon and, and, and uh, uh, didn't keep the Sabbath or don't keep the Sabbath, mm -hmm. etc. As I say, there are many people who are involved in reform institutions, reform rabbis, people studying for the reform rabbinate, who take a very different position now. But uh, this was the, the classical, uh, classical reform. Mm -hmm. And so what is then, 
is, is there a split then between if we call reform and do then orthodox and conservatives lie on, on the other? Well, cons the conservative movement broke off from the reform movement. Yeah. Um, so basically, we had we had one which was orthodox, but, but it wasn't called that because there wasn't. So the orthodox, then we got the reforms, and then the reforms then split also into conservative. So what is the relationship between conservative and orthodox Jewry? Uh, from whose perspective? <laughs> Either, from, I guess. <laughs> from the point of view of the orthodox, there's not much difference. No. Okay. You know. Um, from the, from the uh, uh, point of view of, uh, of the way conservative uh, uh, jury described itself is that it had much more warmth for traditional Jewish ways and practices, mm -hmm. kashrut, Sabbath, etc. Mm -hmm. But even that was not in the in the traditional ways because, as you know, conservative. Uh, Jews a long time ago, the conservative rabbin uh, decided it was okay for people to drive to Shimon Shabbos, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Well, let me just ask about uh, something that seems to be uh, an essential part of, I guess, Jewish thought, whether we consider it uh, just uh, modern uh ethnic Jewry here in the U.S. or in Western Europe or uh, in, in the first world, shall we say, and also just as a religious thing. And that's uh, that I've always found that there's a larger percentage of what I would call secular thought or secularism or tolerance for secularism within Judaism than Christianity, certainly Islam, and a, a number of other faiths. Um, would you agree with that? And if so, what do you think culturally or or religiously? Yeah, I think it's an optical illusion. You do? Okay. Yeah. It's because when it, if a Christian start, stops believing in the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus, uh, et cetera, et cetera, he stops calling himself a Christian. Yeah. Right? But a Jew doesn't uh, stop calling himself a Jew or herself a Jew just because they don't believe or keep the Sabbath mm -hmm. because Jewish identity or Jewish self-perception is not just by any means religious, even in modernity. Mm -hmm. um, that brings up another thing that there seems to always be, at least outside of Jewry, the perception of Jews or Jewish religion uh, Always, there's always seems to be a desire to, to as we, we said earlier, paint Jews as the eternal outsider. For example, uh, certainly the Nazis were big on on the you know the uh, money lending uh, capitalistic Jews, but by the same token, there's also the the within the communist world and whatnot, the idea that Jews were somehow behind communism and whatnot, which seemed to be utterly opposing ideas. What do you think accounts for that stereotyping in such blatantly divergent uh, ways? That's the, way, that's the way stereotypes work. Mm -hmm. If you just look at the stereotypes of, about women, right? The Madonna whore. They're, they're not connected to the earth. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, we know that they're much more primitive and and and. You know, and, 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 and not separated from, from the earth. Uh, you know, stereotypes work that way. They, they, they work through the production of these directly contradictory ambivalences. Mm -hmm. Well, like the, the women being the Madonna or the whore. It's exactly, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Well, uh, taking off on that, too, um, one of the interesting things about... Uh, uh, I guess we call ethnic Jewry, is that uh, it seems to be a matrilineal, uh, the side seems to be the more important, that uh, if you were born of a Jewish mother, you're considered somehow more Jewish than if you had a Jewish father. What is the cause of that uh, historically, and uh, what is the, I guess, rationale for that within the, uh, the religious tenets, if any? Well, there, there's some... Uh There's a lot of argument about where it comes from, but it seems that idea seems to become prominent 
sometime around the first, first or second century. The rationale that's usually given is, is sort of obvious. It's almost vulgar that you can that you can tell who you can always tell who somebody's mother is. You can't always tell who their father is. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's uh, that's. But uh, the other rationale that's given from within Yiddishkeit is that the mother is much more intensely involved in the formation of the personality and uh, of, of the child. And therefore, uh, a child raised by a, uh, a Jewish woman uh, will likely be much more uh, identified with or knowledgeable in or sympathetic to Jewish ways than a child who was raised by a non-Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, sort of uh, turn uh, towards the present and the future of uh, Judaism and, and Jewry. Um, I was just looking up before we uh, I contacted you today uh, uh, some of the things that uh, have been written uh, by you and about you. Uh, what is your opinion of the modern state of Israel in relation to the religion, the religious aspects of Judaism? Do you think that uh, the politicization of Jewry has somehow affected positively or negatively the religious tenets of Judaism? I believe that Zionism is heresy. I'm very old-fetched. I'm convinced that we're supposed to have sovereignty in the, the land of Israel when the Messiah comes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a lot of Jews to think the Messiah is already come, but uh, I'm not convinced. Do, uh, do they mean Jesus Christ, or that there's someone no. living today as the Messiah? No, no. Uh, I mean, through Zionism, they say in their prayers, Reshit smichat kugulatenu, or alta de gulta, that this is the beginning of the redemption. Mm -hmm. or the beginning of the flowering of the redemption. I say two things. First of all, I don't see any reason to believe that, um, a priori. And secondly, if this is the beginning of the redemption, I'm terrified what the end will look like. A redemption ought to make things better, not worse. Are you talking about what would call the soul of the Jewish people then, somehow? It, that seems to be what you imply. Like that. That's a metaphor, yes. Yeah. I think Zionism is ripping, rip, ripping the soul out of the Jewish people, mm -hmm. ripping the heart out of the Jewish people. Yes. So, uh, just to put it in a, a more political, current political context, what do you think that uh, what we would call for the last 25, 30 years... Oh, maybe even 40 years if we go back to uh, the arrival of the Shah in Iran. What is your take on fundamental Islam or Islamism, as some people call it, uh, and its relation to the Jewish state and Jewry? Uh, do, you, do you buy the idea that they want to fundamentally exterminate all Jews the way the Nazis wanted to? I don't see evidence of that. I'm sure there are some people who would like to. Mm -hmm. There are some Christians, there might be some Jews who would like to see the end of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. But uh, 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 I, I'm not convinced that uh, Islamists have a particular animus against Jews as opposed to Christians, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, go ahead. Uh, and also, I think that part of the provocation is is the state of Israel. So, if if you could have your way, you you think that modern Israel should not exist? That Jews should just be in con this continuous state of diaspora, as you said? Well, I think yes, we should stay in Palestine also as part of a diasporic yeah. formation. Why yeah. not? There are a couple of million Jews in Israel, but I don't uh, and. Uh, I think the thriving of the Hebrew language would be much more difficult if there were not mm. uh, Israel and the, the concentration of interest in Jewish scholarship, although that's getting less and less all the time. Uh, my colleagues who teach in Israeli universities say that uh, their classes get smaller every year, those who teach Jewish studies in you know, Talmud, Bible, and Midrash, etc. Um, but uh, 
sovereignty, Jewish sovereignty, I think is a serious mistake, having a Jewish state. Well, the, the way you just, were just speaking there, um, in the future, if you if you look down the line a century, two centuries, you know, into the middle of uh, this coming millennium, or this the millennium we just started, actually, um, do you see then that, uh, or do you think that Judaism as a religion or Jewry as uh, uh, a separate ethnic identity of some meaning is, is is just basically almost destined to just be absorbed into other cultures, with the exception, perhaps, of the state of Israel, however long it is. No, I don't think... We've been hanging on so far. Shouldn't we keep... Yeah. There are always, there are always enough stubborn Jews around to want to keep it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not a place the way we think it's going to be. Look at the Yiddish movement among among lesbian and gay, gay Jews. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Yiddish movement is much broader than that in America, but a lot of it comes from lesbian and gay Jews also, which is fascinating. But there, there's more and more Yiddish, more and more Yiddish being spoken yeah. by young Jews now than 20 years ago or 30 years or 40 years ago. Uh, Hebrew has become world language again. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, if, I walk into a, if I walk into a butcher shop in Krakow or Paris or Tunis, the great likelihood is that there's going to be somebody behind the computer who can speak Hebrew with me. Yeah. Um, I, I meet Jews from all over the world, and we have a common language, not just English, but we speak Hebrew with each other. This is a sign of, of, of real vitality. Mm -hmm. There's a new Hebrew language, literary, and cultural journal being published in, in Paris and Berlin for the last two years. Do you think that uh, the diversity and the diaspora has had benefits in that uh, different portions of, say, Asian or South American, uh, American, uh, uh, Indian maybe, perhaps, uh, and other African, or for example, the Ethiopian African. So do you think that Jewry is stronger for the diversity that has come through the diaspora? Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just wrap up then. Uh, let me just ask you, because uh, you've written a number of books on the subject, what, what is, uh, in uh, you know, your remaining years, what would you like to see within your lifetime, or is there any project that, that you'd like to complete in your lifetime regarding uh, the subject of uh, the Jewish people or, or, or their beliefs? You mean in my own, in my own work, or... Uh, or uh, or, or, or a project for the Jewish people. It, well, well, do do it uh, I mean, both I, personally. I would really like. I would. I mean, right now, my I, uh, it, it may have been coming out in different ways in my conversation. Um, I would really, really like to become thoroughly conversant in Yiddish. I'd really like to mm -hmm. to um, to know Yiddish very well, to be able to speak it, to be able to read it. It's literature to have read a lot of literature. That um, that that is um, one of the factors that really, really um, pulls me right now. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see a restoration of a, an international Yiddish speaking or Hebrew speaking um, Jewish uh, left mm -hmm. with. You know, passionate devotion to, to the welfare and continue the welfare of the Jewish people, continuation of Jewish ways of, of, of living, of Jewish, and um, deep connection to to social justice and uh, uh, and uh, economic justice for all the people of the world. Um, you mentioned. Uh, uh the Hebrew has come back as a world language. Do you think now that Yiddish has suffered, or is Yiddish still a, a language that's out there? Well, Yiddish is still out there to, to a great extent, but Hebrew is partly replacing it as the world Jewish language. Uh -huh. um, more Jews are learning Hebrew than are learning Yiddish. Um, and um, also, 
people it does have one advantage. It's the language of one of the Jews. Yiddish is still the language of one part of the Jewish people, and Hebrew is the language of all the Jews. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess I'll just end this uh, since we've talked mainly about uh, uh, the the Jewish religion. Uh, do you? What is your? Are you sanguine on the future of the state of Israel or not? Uh, do you think that uh, uh, it's? Uh, do, do you see reconciliation in any way between uh, Jews and the Arab world? Uh, say by the end of this century, do you think? Not a question. Of to answer. No. Okay. Since I'm not a since I'm not a navi, not a prophet, mm -hmm. uh, I don't answer future questions. If you ask me what I'd like to see, I'd like to see the Messiah come mm -hmm. soon. So let me just uh, finally then ask them: Are you then a believer uh, in what we, we would call supernaturalism? I talked about Jesus Christ as a historical figure and also as a deity. Are you are you someone who is grounded in science and in, in the real world, or when you speak of the Messiah, do you mean just in in the the political sense that there's going to be someone who will be a figure? No, no, no. I mean, in the, in the deeply traditional sense. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I don't think science is the real world. Uh -huh. Well, it's interesting because uh, uh, you you do you you seem to in some ways be very hue to ways that seem to be outside the traditional belief systems, and in other ways you seem to be, uh, uh, as you say, you uh, within within them. But uh, um, I want to thank you then for spending an hour or so talking to me about your views on uh, Jewishness and Judaism then. Uh, so unless you have a, a final comment to say no, on anything. No, it's been a pleasure. All right. So, well, thank, thank you very much. You so be well. <laughs>